Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, and theta meditation teacher. Above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on a quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What life is all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. Welcome to the brand new, exciting season four of Quantum Living. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode is a little different. Alongside my passion for all things quantum, paranormal and spiritual, I have always been very interested in health and nutrition as the foundation of our wellness, broadly speaking. Even as a child, I intuitively knew that what we put into our body literally makes up our physical being and influences our mood. And it's not just the nutrients, the macros and micros, but the energy that those foods and non-foods have that matters. So very early in my life, I understood the difference between food and nutrition, which many people still don't quite understand or don't want to. (laughs) My personal definition of food is anything that we can safely digest, that will satisfy hunger, and give us energy we can use to stay alive. That's it. I suspect that many teenagers live by this definition of food. Nutrition, on the other hand, is food which contributes to our health and well-being with various elements or nutrients that our body needs. I was born and grew up in Europe, where herbs and other plants were the foundation of the folk medicine for thousands of years. And to this day, I use certain herbs and natural supplements exclusively for various ailments and health issues, without resorting to drugs. So, with this topic being so close to my heart, I have decided to find an expert on health and nutrition and have a chat about all that healthy stuff. (laughs) And I did find a super expert. My special guest today is Giovanni Casiares. Jivanka is a former entertainment executive turned integrative herbalist, wellness coach, detox specialist, nutrition educator and author. She is the creator of the Wellness Smackdown, an online wellness and learning community for healthy living, which was featured in the first season of the ABC series My Diet is Better Than Yours. Jivanka is the author of three books, Cleanse, the three-week ultimate detox challenge, cook, easy recipes for the busy wellness warrior, and the newest book, Reclaiming Wellness, Ancient Wisdom for Your Healthy, Happy, and Beautiful Life, which we will, of course, talk about. Jivanka was featured in People Magazine, Entertainment Tonight, NPR, CBS Radio, Telemundo, and The Huffington Post, amongst many other influential platforms, and gave her first TEDx talk on Rethinking Failure in November 2013. A native of Puerto Rico, she currently lives in LA, from where she runs her popular wellness practice, offering lectures, workshops, and wellness coaching in Spanish and English. And now, Jovanka joins me from L.A. Hello, Jovanka. Welcome to Quantum Living. Como estas? It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. It's such a pleasure. What a beautiful intro. Thank you for having me. 
Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Based on your work and achievements, you are clearly passionate about wellness and nutrition. And behind every passion, there is always a story. Could you please share with us your story? What has led you onto this path, including the influence of your beautiful multicultural background? Yeah, so... I, once again, thank you so much for having me here. And um, yes, you're very, very right. I think everybody has a story that that shapes their reality today and hopefully helps them understand uh, their bodies in a way that they help them uh, live happily and, and, and in health for many, many decades to come. I come from a tiny island in the Caribbean. I grew up near the rainforest and near the ocean with home cooked meals and eating, you know, fruit from the neighbor's trees and just enjoying a very simple yet idyllic life. And when I moved to New York City as a young adult to go to school and study and become a professional, I moved away from that lifestyle as well. So I started eating food, as you mentioned in your introduction, <laughs> instead of taking too much concern about my nutrition, I just ate whatever was in front of me or whatever I could afford. Because as you can imagine, as a, as a young student, I, means were not really what was important at the time. And mm -hmm. my body gave me what I like to call a smackdown with air quotes, because I had a, a number of conditions, all of them considered non-curable by Western medicine standards, mm -hmm. and uh, but chronic in nature. So I was given a diagnosis of you're going to be in pain for the rest of your life. You're going to be this in discomfort for the rest of your life. And there is nothing we can do. So, of course, you know, as a young woman, uh, I was very willing to learn and to use my own body as a guinea pig. And I decided not to take no for an answer. So I went back to my ancestry, went back to my grandmother teaching me how to use plants as medicine changed my diet, started mm -hmm. learning about things like Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, Western herbalism. And all in all, I incorporated a lot of these practices into my life and my body started to heal. And that became a big passion in my life. Oh, beautiful story. Thank you for sharing. And it's, it is so powerful because it started with your own health issues. And there is, I think, nothing more compelling for us to change something, then health issues. When health goes down, then this is a wake-up call. Wonderful. Now, I have to ask this right at the start. The name of your online community, Wellness Smackdown, <laughs> <laughs> which I really love, but could you, could you just explain for our listeners, what is the Smackdown? part of it. <laughs> yeah, so um so that is it's interesting cuz that is a name that we'll be changing at the top of the year. Okay. Uh and and we'll be calling it Reclaiming Wellness because I I've been working on on the book Reclaiming mm -hmm. Wellness and a lot of other educational initiatives, but the idea behind the smackdown is that my own body gave me a smackdown. But to me that smackdown was a blessing in disguise because I got lucky, right? My smackdown wasn't a life-threatening disease. Yeah. For a lot of others, that smackdown might be called cancer, or it might be called heart disease, or Alzheimer's. And, um, not, and it doesn't mean that you are given a, a, a death sentence. It means it's just your body trying to talk to you for many years, maybe decades, you're not listening to it. And so now your body's kind of smacking you in the head, telling you, <laughs> please pay attention. So the idea and, and the goal of this community is to educate people, get them excited and feeling empowered to taking back control over their own healing journey with the use of foods, herbs, and obviously a lot of like wellness traditions, like meditation and other mindfulness. Mm, mm. Looking at the information on your website about your various courses and, and classes, and we will get to that in a moment, I have a feeling or I have an impression that the smackdown is your approach. Like you want to wake people up. <laughs> 
Is it is this right? Is this your approach? Yeah, like I to... think it's. I mean, I don't. I'm not. I, don't, I want people to understand that I'm not trying to advocate for violence, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just a loving wellness map down. It's it's mm -hmm. a way yeah. of telling yeah. you, I'm here to be the voice of reason, right? Like that little creature in the back of your ear, constantly telling you what is it that you're doing today, and when you consume what you're consuming today, whether it is by what you're feeding your mind or what you're feeding your body. How does your body feel an hour after that that particular meal? Maybe 24 hours after the meal, maybe five days after the meal. At the mm. end of the day, your body is constantly talking to us and it's incumbent upon us to listen attentively and understand the language so that the we don't get to a point of smackdown or we can reverse some of the symptoms of our own personal smackdown. Absolutely. So what ancient wisdom and knowledge do you draw on in your work and in your books? What specifically? So many. But <laughs> I would <laughs> say, you know, I, I started by learning about Ayurveda, which is mm -hmm. the Eastern medicine tradition of, of India and Southeast yeah. Asia, traditional Chinese medicine. But the one thing that truly caught my heart and soul was herbalism. And mm. I say that. Uh, with a little bit of clarity, I want to clarify because you mentioned in your introduction that in Europe you have a thousand year old tradition of using plants and botanicals. Yeah. Every culture around the world, every single one of them has used plants, oils, herbs, foods to attain whether it is healing, wellness, or different levels of spirituality. And so in some places, it might be called traditional Chinese medicine. In some others, it might be called Ayurveda. But at the uh -huh. end of the day, we all have that. That's part of our DNA. And how amazing it would be if we all got, got to reclaim it. Absolutely. How do you think people in the very early days, say thousands of years ago, at the beginning of, of our civilization, how did people obtain this knowledge that plants, uh, I mean, obviously in terms of nutrition, that would be an instinct, you know, just like animals eat whatever they need to eat <laughs> in order to, to stay alive. So that would be an instinct. But we took the knowledge and the usage of plants much further because we have the knowledge and we did have the knowledge back then, perhaps growing and increasing knowledge of the specific properties of specific plants, plants that can cure, plants that can harm, that can that have specific properties to assist in different ailments, which plants can be taken together and which shouldn't. So obviously there was no science that we have now that can break down every pretty much plant and, and down to the molecules and examine everything. So how do you think that knowledge was acquired in the first place? Yeah, this was a combi, and this is a great question, by the way. Thank you for asking this, because we all as herbalists are always fascinated with that story. But the truth of the matter is that it's a combination of human curiosity and trial and error. You know, back in the day, somebody saw a little, a little, and some of the foods is instinctive, right? We know that something is colorful, is bright, is it has a beautiful scent. So maybe I'm just gonna like put it in my mouth and see what happens. And if I don't die or I don't get very sick, <laughs> <laughs> I might jot that down or or draw a little a little image and maybe share it with other people that are also curious. And then they will share in the knowledge mm. for year after year, decade and century and, and millennia after millennia. We now have this amazing, you know, body of work that is actually tangible. Like in the case of Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, a lot of it is still around in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, with colonization and whatnot, like some of it has been lost. But a lot of these plants, a lot of these botanicals, we mm -hmm. have learned to use them by passing that knowledge through stories, through, you know, like what we know today as, as you know, 
shamans or, or healers, which may have been women in some cultures, men in some others, pass that knowledge to the next generation until we learn how to make them better and how to use them for our own advantage. And what is really amazing is that now with modern medicine, we can go and compare the thousands of years of anecdotal evidence with scientific modern evidence and realize, oh, wow, these people, they, they had yeah. something <laughs> to the, There was something to their knowledge. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I and I agree with you that obviously that was an evolving knowledge passed on from one generation to to the next. And initially that was, as you said, by trial and error. You know, I'll try this plant or the other, and then you know, if I survive, <laughs> I can I can sort of pass on the, the consequences or the effects of that particular plant. So yes, I agree, but would you also I think that perhaps a part of that knowledge came through some spiritual insights passed on by shamans, medicine, men and women, and other people who were connected to the spirit and were receiving this information as an insight? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. First, it could have been one of two ways, right? It could have been that the plants themselves once ingested, allow them to connect to that spiritual part of them that is super connected to the beyond. Or it could have been the other way around, right? It could have been that somebody, you know, like in another realm, we are trying, to, you know, the, the spirits are trying to pass on knowledge and, you know, find the people that were open to that particular insight, pass them on, and then that person will then pass them on to the rest of us. Yes, absolutely. I remember there was one particular example that, that I can share. It just stuck in my mind. As I mentioned in my intro, I've been always interested in, in wellness and health and nutrition. And I've been doing a lot of my own research and, and studies and reading, etc. So I know that, for example, spinach is a particular food which shouldn't be eaten too often because apart from the obvious beneficial nutrients, it also has one particular nutrient, uh, which the name of which just escapes me, but which interferes with uh, calcium absorption. I know this based on the current science. So people shouldn't be eating spinach salad every day, <laughs> <laughs> as far as I, I understand. But what struck me was that when I was little, my grandma was always saying that we mustn't eat spinach too often. So she would like cook spinach maybe a couple of times a month. And I remembered that she was saying this. So how did she know that spinach is one of those foods that you need to be careful with and just eat occasionally, not every day? Again, I assume that that was passed on from her mother and her grandmother you know, across the generations. But even this very practical knowledge about a very common food is so unusual that she actually knew that. You know, one of the things that you reminded me of just now is that back in the day, right, our mothers, grandmothers, maybe a few generations back, we were a lot more in tune with our bodies, with the environment around us. And it was a lot easier to recognize if I had something that made me feel a little gassy or a little constipated or a little headachy, I noticed I may start thinking about what is it that I had. Maybe I try it again to see if the symptoms com continue to appear. And then you start recognizing, okay, mm -hmm. this might be good, but it doesn't really work as well for me as it might work for others. In today's society, we've moved away from that. We're constantly achy. We constantly feel conversations, because I call them conversations that your body is having with you, but we insist on ignoring them. Every time you get constipated, every time you feel gassy, every time you feel a little sad, sadder than normal, that is something your body is trying to tell you. And it could be food related. It could be whatever you're feeding in your mind, <laughs> certainly, um, or your lack of connection with the world around you. But at the end of the day, it's still very much a conversation. And we, we need to get back to connecting with our own bodies. So how do we do that? How do you teach people to do that? 
one of the first things I tell my clients is I put them on a uh, little, um, everybody needs to start writing a little uh, journal. Mm -hmm. So it does, if you're not a writer, don't worry too much about it. All I'm asking you is for the next seven days, you maybe write at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, how do you feel? You want to do it in relation to what you're feeding your mind, but also what you're feeding your body, right? Like today I feel gassy. Today I feel PMSy. Tomorrow I'm feeling uh, angry. I'm feeling jealousy. Like be honest, be truly, truly honest with yourself. At the end of the week, you have a plethora of information on, on those pages. It's, it's a book. You'll, you'll realize how much your body is telling you. <laughs> That you had not paid attention to before. Yes, yes, this is so important and really such a simple step. So now once, say, uh, someone has recorded uh, faithfully <laughs> and in detail how they were feeling and uh, do you also ask them to uh, to keep a journal or a diary of uh, what of the food, what they were eating? It depends on the case, but a lot of people, especially women, I work with a lot of women that are trying to reclaim their relationship with their bodies. And that means eating the right types of foods or finding ways to lose weight or to gain weight, yeah. depending on the situation. So in some cases I do, in a lot of cases, people don't need it. And it's just all about learning how to, what are the conversations that your body's having? And then once you have a clear picture, you create little, uh, you know, tools or exercises to help them address whatever it might be. And that's when you use also your herb and herbal protocols to help you address that conversation or those symptoms. Yes, it is very important. And just very quickly, one other example came to my mind of a, a natural supplement that I use. I mean, I've always used, you know, since I was little, and I always have it at home. There is, you know, to the, to this day, activated charcoal. I've been always told by my mother, my grandmother, to take it whenever I had, you know, tummy upset. And now, because of the scientific analysis of activated charcoal, we know that it absorbs heavy metals, it absorbs poisons. So this is the first thing that, say, when you go to the emergency room with food poisoning or some poisoning, they will pump activated liquid, activated charcoal to your stomach, you know, as the first uh, sort of measure to to stop the the poison. So, so I never take any drugs for upset stomach or any indigestion or any digestive problems. It's just stuck in my mind again, such a simple remedy that is available, but most people don't realize how potent it is and how much healthier and better it is for us than getting a drug. Um, could you just talk to this for a moment? Yeah, you know, it. it's so true. Like, I remember my grandmother giving us all kinds of different concoctions every time we felt a particular way. Like the first time I had menstrual cramps, for example, she just went in the back, came back and came with this green thing and put it right on my belly. And the pain went away 20 mm. minutes later. Um, and so, but to your point, you know, whether it is activated charcoal or, you know, it could be something even simpler like ginger or fennel seeds, you can you can use things that are relatively common and easy for you to sort of wrap your mind around. Because a lot of people will say, well, you know, I've never tried this. It, I don't know what it tastes like. Is it safe? The truth of the matter is that these botanicals are some of the best studied substances yeah. on earth. Not only because they have been used for thousands of years. So there's a lot of anecdotes talking of people using them in all kinds of different forms. But now Western medicine have said, wait, so these people in that corner have been using that particular plant for 6,000 yeah. years. Let me yeah. test it and make sure that it's really as safe yeah. as we believe it is. And so we now know that it's not only really popular and powerful, but it's also very, very safe. Yes. For you. And obviously 
there is a reason why the plant's kingdom is called the God's pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, it not only sustains our uh, life and, and well-being and health, but there is a cure for pretty much everything and, and anything. Now, you have a training and expertise in several areas with the overarching theme of mind-body wellness that we have touched upon. What about our spiritual dimension to complete the mind-body-spirit triangle? Do you incorporate it in your work? Oh, my God, all the time. That is, it's impossible not to, right? We are not just a mind and a body. We are also a soul, and it needs nourishment. It also goes through stages, right, of evolution and of, of realization of areas of lack of balance, as we like to call it in, in Ayurveda and in, in Western herbalism. We don't like to talk, talk about diseases. We talk about imbalances. Yes. Uh, more than anything, because we understand that exactly, like, not everybody is, is the same. You might actually be perfectly balanced exactly as you are today. So if you're talking about somebody who was born, for example, without the ability to see that person's body and, and being finds a way to to keep balance yeah. with the within the life around them, right? So that what is balanced to them might be different to or what it might be to me. So spirit is to me one of the the most important. If in many ways it could be considered the most important part. Mm -hmm. A lot of us uh, need to learn to differentiate what we know today as Western religions or our particular set of dogmas and spirituality. And and I make that distinction because there's a lot of practices that are so beautiful that are considered spiritual pra practices that a lot of people might shy away from them mm -hmm. because they feel like it might be in antithesis to their religion and nothing could be farther from the truth. You can... Uh, you can um, enjoy your religious practice and, and practice your dogma uh, if it makes you uh, better and happier and brings you joy. Mm -hmm. And also incorporate some other practices that perhaps may allow you to connect a little bit further, a little bit in more significant way with that spiritual part of you. Yes. So we're talking about the difference between religion and spirituality. Mm -hmm. In my mind, spirituality is a much broader concept, as you have just mentioned. Do you incorporate in your programs with clients, do you incorporate or, or recommend at least or suggest any particular practices that include a spiritual component? For example, yoga. Is it part of your work? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's part of my life uh, uh, and my personal life, but it's also part of my practice as well. I am a Reiki master. So I always, uh, in, in some cases, not, not, or not everybody is open to that or might need it. I do a little bit of a Reiki session with them. Um, I love uh, meditation. It's critical to me. I, I would not be the human I am today without <laughs> meditating. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's what keeps me grounded. Absolutely. Uh, somebody yeah. with a lot of fire in me. Um, I, I need that kind of grounding. And then I love um, hypnosis as well. I've, I've used hypnosis to help me with fears, but also to help me connect uh, with my spiritual, with my spiritual self, with the people that I absolutely love that are no longer here, that are only in spirit right now. And I feel mm -hmm deeply connected to, to some of them, especially my godmother and my grandmother mm -hmm. who are no longer here. And just last night, I was having a gorgeous um, self, uh, you know, my own little mini spiritual practice with, with self-hypnosis, trying to, to connect with, with my elders. So are you trained in hypnotherapy or do you recommend to your clients to go and see a hypnotherapist in some cases? Yes, I am not trained in hypnosis. <laughs> I am definitely somebody that would recommend. I have two or three amazing hypnotherapists that I love, uh, one of whom has a practice that's large enough, so they have uh, various therapists. And uh, yeah, I recommend it wholeheartedly. Uh, I was able to 
manage my fear of flying. And since I've been traveling, oh. I've been to 30 <laughs> countries, 35 countries, uh, thanks to, to my work with hypnosis. My relationship with my father has become increasingly better uh, thanks to hypnosis. And certainly my connection with with the world around me. I, I love animals, but I never really knew how to connect with them until I started practicing. Wow, hypnosis. beautiful. And thank you for sharing. And I think it is really important for practitioners in the field of health and wellness both mental and, and physical, to be able to refer clients to other specialists because, I mean, one person can't be a master in, in every single area. <laughs> Maybe there are such people. I don't, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of them. I know what I know and I know what I don't. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, we all have our limits. Plus, I think... It is also helpful because I do the same with my clients. I mean, I'm also a Reiki master, so I do energy healing and I do quantum coaching uh, and I also do meditation. But uh, for example, uh, when I see a need for my client to uh, be working with a naturopath, I would refer them or recommend that they see a naturopath. So I think this is important because it also brings in different energy and perspective and angle and their area of expertise the client can benefit from so it's it so to me this is a a truly holistic approach to helping people uh, regain health mental physical balance and improve their lives would you agree absolutely no absolutely i i mean i couldn't agree more i think we need to know what we know but also be, you know, when you're when you have a client or, or a patient in front of you, you are a, a partner to that person, and it's critical that you recognize w how far you can go, and hopefully be have a community of other practitioners that can then come together to help people heal. So where where I end, uh, you can then begin and hopefully help that person become whole once again. When we talk about herbalism and integrative herbalism in particular, and I'll ask you to, to uh, explain the term integrative herbalism, let's talk about the wisdom and energy of the plants. Could you speak to this for a moment? That's such a beautiful term. I love it. So everything in nature has wisdom is what you were saying about humans you can also agree that animals do too and even plants do if you have a plant in a pot and and that plant gets really only a handful of hours of of sun you'll start noticing that the plant will tilt to one side looking to get more and more hours of sun yeah. again another yeah. thing that is yeah. <laughs> one of the things that if you observe it you're like the plant is talking to you it's actually it reminds me of one of my plants <laughs> <laughs> so we we all have that energy and it you know, one of the things that I tell clients all the time is that we as humans need to learn to be humble to the wisdom of Mother Nature. Yes. We believe Thank you. the perfect yeah. example is people that are dog people and not cat people. Um, and it's because it's the easiest way to explain it. It's like when you see somebody that says, I'm not a cat person. I'm like, are you really not a cat person or are you just not understanding the language of a cat? Because a dog is very expressive, right? You know exactly what's happening to a dog, whether he's angry, sad, or happy, you know exactly what's happening. But a, a cat might not communicate the same way you communicate. And it doesn't mean that he's not smart or wise. In fact, it might mean that he's wiser than you and doesn't need to expend a lot of energy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. So it's all about humbling ourselves to the fact that there is all this wisdom around us. One of the things that I talk about in my book is about grounding and not just with foods, but with going out in nature, even if it's cold or rainy, 
spend a few minutes in the in the rain or it, uh, bare feet in the grass and truly pay attention to what's going on around you in the non-human world. If you do that for about 21 to 28 days, which is how long it takes us to build a new habit, you will start realizing how much we are missing and how gorgeous and amazing this thing that we call Mother Nature is. And we will learn to love it and protect it and honor it even more. Mm. Oh, I'm loving it. Thank you. This is this is so beautiful what you have just said. So let's talk about your new book. Has it come out yet, by the way, or is it oh, still yes. coming? It has. Book is okay. out and available everywhere books are sold. Okay, beautiful. So this is your newest book, Reclaiming Wellness, Ancient Wisdom for Your Healthy, Happy, and Beautiful Life. Could you give us a synopsis of that book? What are the key messages in it? Yeah, yeah the book explores the, the really popular wellness practices today and how it comes from cultures from all over the world. So the idea is that it's not just for those people who might have the means or are the trendy young people that go to yoga classes and that kind of stuff. That's great that they've embraced it. But what about the rest of humanity that are struggling with what we know today as diseases of the modern era? And how can we use these wellness practices to reclaim the practices that came from us, came from our ancestry, as we said at the beginning, Mm -hmm. and with it, reclaim our rightful state of wellness. So I go through seven buckets of categories, and it's very, very easy to digest, literally, Mm -hmm. because that is Mm -hmm. my motto. Pun intended. (laughs) Pun intended. (laughs) So I like to keep it very simple, talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about the history, talk a little bit about the modern application, and then show you how you can incorporate it into your daily routine. Beautiful. So, for example, what would be your recommended holistic approach? to the three most common health issues in the modern times, in my mind, which is weight loss or weight management, let's say, stress and boosting immunity. Could you just give us a few few tips? Mm, Yeah, absolutely. So let me start with immunity because it's the one that Mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier for people to wrap their mind around it. Um, we, we, when we handle immunity in the, in the alternative mm-hmm. medicine tradition, we do one of two ways. We prevent, right? We try to avoid what might come. And in the case of people that have, have an illness is try to strengthen the system so that the system does what it does best, which is fight pathogens and diseases. You do that by reducing inflammation with foods, alkaline foods, water, with management, uh, stress management, sleep, mm-hmm. all of the things that we take for granted yeah. that are super simple will help you reduce inflammation. Certainly an alkaline diet is critical. And then there's a lot of botanicals. Again, I, I'm going to mention botanicals over and over because they're so amazing. When we're talking about the immune system, we're talking about vitamin E, vitamin D, which comes from the sun. We're talking about ginger, which is just this amazing little root that helps in many, many, many ways. One of the other things that I absolutely love is not really a botanical. They're called fungi so or fungi or, or mushrooms. So I'm talking about um lion's mane and reishi mushroom and turkey tail and those that are considered medicinal or others that might be considered edible in nature. So things like portobello mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms, maitake mushrooms, all of those have an incredible strength and properties to help you strengthen your immunity. They also have the ability to go inside your body and grab what doesn't belong in that in your body similar to that charcoal that we were talking about earlier, and literally push it out and push it out of your body. So when it comes to immunity, that is probably one of my approaches. When it comes to stress management, oh, wow. Where do (laughs) we begin? (laughs) Where do I begin? I mean, one of the easiest ways to manage stress, believe it or not, is with, is again, one of those practices that could be really, simple, but also very powerful because a lot of us are shallow breathers and you have the ability to, with control breath, to take your body from that fight, flight, or free state 
to a parasympathetic nervous state where yes. you can digest food, you can rest, you can yeah. replenish. It's just a wonderful place of being. When it comes to the botanicals, because once again, um, I love my adaptogens. So plants that will help you adapt to stressful circumstances. Lemon balm, ashwagandha, maca powder are three of the very popular ones. Rhodiola, there's probably two dozen out there that will help you tremendously. All of those can be consumed in either food or in tea form. And then the very first thing that you asked me, which was about weight loss or weight management. Weight management. Mm -hmm. That is the trickiest one of them all because weight loss in and of itself is just a basic math equation. Any and all diet out there could eventually help you lose weight. Mm -hmm. It might be, you know, veganism for you. It might be keto for another person. It might be just, you know, something that is very specific in a third person. But at the end of the day, the issues with weight loss is access or access, right? It could be access to healthy foods, access to the means to buy healthy foods, or access to the knowledge that will tell you where and how to consume that food. And then secondly, it's about redefining and reclaiming the relationship with your body. Because too many of us have spent decades being told by the media, by our parents, by well-meaning friends, you will be, you will look so much better, or you will find the love of your life, or you will get that perfect job if you fill in the blank, right? Like lost five pounds or lost 10 pounds or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then after decades of that kind of bad conversation, we have learned that we're not worth it, that we're not, that, that, you know, we need to be skinnier and slimmer or better or have a smaller nose or a fuller cheek or bigger boobs or smaller butt. So it, it, learning that aspect will, will take time. Again, it takes 21 to 28 days to build a new habit. When it comes to changing the relationship with your body, it could take as long as three months. So it's, it's a process. Yes, absolutely. And also when it comes to weight management in particular, I believe strongly that there are two key parts to it. One is the equation of diet and exercise. So, you know, the intake and also looking how your body is actually processing certain foods uh, and then energy expenditure such as exercise. Yeah. But the other one is the emotional aspect because certain people tend to have negative energies or negative experiences, traumas stuck in their body. And the link is that they will often create an additional layers of fat as a protection yeah. when they feel unsafe in their environment. And I feel that the third aspect to have a good relationship with your body that you have addressed to understand your body, to listen to your body and to communicate, to understand its signals is perhaps the another arching part because it combines the two. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I, you You've mentioned so many beautiful nuggets in there, um, but I exactly agree. There is, um, you know, as a, as a coach that also works with detoxification, I see that a lot. You know, you you may have had a trauma and ended up in the hospital and you're back to your daily routine, but now you can't get rid of the of the excessive amount of fat. And I tell people all the time, fat is a protective mechanism. It's a it's a substance that's there to wrap molecules that might be considered chemicals or tox toxic in nature. And it wraps it as a protective mechanism. So as long as you remain toxic your fat is not going to leave you because it's trying to protect you. And so cleansing, whether it is uh, doing juicing or with just food, with whole foods, could also help. Absolutely. And I think it is important to highlight for our listeners that the protective role of extra fat is not only physiological, 
but it is also a psychological protection because the physical aspect of the extra amount of fat serves as a psychological protection, unintentionally, obviously, but it does. So people who are introvert, people who are very sensitive, people who are empath, people who have experienced significant traumas, allow their body to build that extra layers of literally physical protection of those extra layers of fat. Mm -hmm. So for best results, it needs to be addressed holistically from both angles. Because if, for example, you simply put someone on a strict diet and exercise regime, yes, they will lose weight. But when they finish, what happens? The weight comes back. Even, in fact, more than, than they had before. And it's not, in my personal view, it's not the physiological aspect, although it can be if there are still harmful substances in, in the body, but if the psychological aspect hasn't been resolved, the body says, I'm still feeling unsafe. I need to put back all this fat you know, back on because I'm still unsafe. So that's why, yes, you can lose a lot of weight just on diet and exercise alone. But if you haven't fixed the issue in your head and emotionally and psychologically, the weight will come back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and with the understanding that you're not, you didn't get here overnight, you're not going to get out of it overnight. And that includes the emotional weight that we have been carrying with us, right? Let's just, if one thing the pandemic has taught me is to give each other grace, uh, much more grace than we were giving each other before. But that means starting with you, right? Starting with the person you see in the mirror every day. Uh, if for some reason anybody that's listening is not ready to work with a coach uh, for whatever reason, the, then I, I always encourage people to work on, on what the, per, the person that they see in the mirror Right, like accepting, understanding, giving themselves <laughs> grace. Yeah, today I'm getting I there. might not be ready to say I love I'm you. Getting there. But I do love you. I'm just I <laughs> this is I'm getting there, right? And I'm giving myself grace. I understand that this is a process. Yes, absolutely. Beautifully said. So um I'd like to uh, now talk about another topic which is uh, specifically close to my heart. And I will talk about it at any opportunity I can. (laughs) Could you please speak to the importance and benefits of plant-based diet? So vegan, vegetarian, so in principle, moving away from animal products. That is also a topic that's near and dear to my heart because it was a plant-based diet that helped me heal. Um, And to your point that you can change almost any diet at, at, at you know overnight but you won't stick to that particular diet unless you truly educate yourself and you truly understand the reasons why so to me uh, being plant based means two things understanding that going back to your argument about uh, that that energy that living energy and that connectivity that we have with the plant with the with mother uh, with with mother nature uh it's foods that are alive or foods that are considered whole are to me a lot more important than foods that have been you know killed most likely in a way that yeah. was antithetical to <laughs> nature right like these are Animals in, in, in food agriculture today, in, in animal agriculture today, uh, we, we talk about the, the ridiculously large number of animals that are killed cause these animals to live a very short and very miserable life and die a very miserable death. And so that kind of energy is not energy that I necessarily want to put in this machine that I call a body. Thank you. Uh, and then there is also the issue that from the purely biological and scientific issue, and this is something I mentioned in the book, we are more hardwired to absorb better nutrients and to utilize them better when they come from the plant world. Uh, T. Colin Campbell, which is the author of, of the uh, China study, one of the largest nutrition studies ever conducted um, on the planet, talks about how 
there is there is not a single type of nutrient, whether it's a macro or micronutrient, in the in animal flesh that cannot be found in the plant world. But the most important part for me is that at a purely physiological level, animal flesh causes a lot of acidity in the body, a lot of inflammation. And that inflammation is directly related to the issues that we suffer from today. The, the diseases that are considered perfectly preventable and are killing most humans today. Heart disease, cancer, um, respiratory issues, Alzheimer's, neurological conditions. So it makes sense to me to eat more plants than not. I am also not a proselytizer, so I recognize that for most of us who have lived with with animals, most of eating animals most of our lives, that process will take time. It definitely took me several years to go full plant based, and so I encourage people to first and foremost educate themselves. Pick up a book, pick up a documentary, learn a little bit. Maybe start by eliminating one thing that you don't really like that much. Maybe you're not a big fan of you know pork that's okay then you just eliminate pork and you know keep on going and then slowly but steadily as you educate yourself and incorporate other things because that's the other thing we don't ever want to be in a situation where you eliminate a lot of foods and then leave a void that will help you will, will leave you feeling helpless and and hungry for literally hungry physically and emotionally Yes, and I'm really glad, thank you for that, I'm really glad that you have mentioned both the energy aspect of animal flesh in particular, so I'm not necessarily talking about dairy products or eggs, but about animal flesh, because it contains fear and pain, the last emotions that were trapped in the body in the moment the animal was was slaughtered which mean a lot of stress hormones. So the meat that we buy has high levels of stress hormones. And then obviously the physiological aspects of it, high acidity causing inflammation, huge, huge issue. Yes. And So again, thank you for mentioning both aspects of it. And the third one being education. A lot of people will say, well, I do need to eat some meat products because of vitamin B12. If you eat eggs, eggs have a lot of vitamin B12 in them, good levels. Mushrooms have good levels of vitamin B12, and I'm sure that there are some other plants uh, that also have it. So you can not to eat meat and still have a proper diet that will provide you with all those nutrients that your body does need. So that's really important. And it won't happen overnight, but when people start thinking about it and getting educated about it, they can start making very healthy changes. And they will notice that, oh gosh, you know, my cholesterol has improved and I no longer have aches and pains in my joints because the inflammation goes down. Mm -hmm. So very, very important. And thank you so much for, for addressing that. Now, uh, Jivanka, would you be able to give us perhaps a couple of interesting case studies from your work with clients in terms of improvement in their health and well-being, whether using herbs or, or any other approach, something that really stands out in your practice? Could you give us a couple of examples? You know, one of the things that I just remember because you were just talking about uh, about this issue of animal flesh versus uh, plant-based foods is I work with a lot of people in different stages of cancer diagnosis, uh, whether it is they just got diagnosed or they are in remission. That's when people really start paying attention to their diet and lifestyle is when when they are faced with their own mortality. So I worked a couple of, uh, at this point, it's probably almost a year with a gentleman that had a second bout of cancer. Uh, and um, 
his doctor, even though he was in the middle of chemo, his doctor was really reluctant to him working with me. He felt like okay. it will be, you know, using some of the supplements that I was um, recommending where it could have been, you know, apparently not very, very safe. So I told oh, him, God you know, forbid, gonna... help him. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I said, you know what? We're going to listen to your doctor. So I'm not here to fight with anybody. Yeah. He was, he was uh, ambivalent about it. So we waited until he was done with the chemo. He was halfway, when, when, he, when we met, he was halfway through with the chemo already. Yeah. We waited and then I put him on a very strong regime uh, for, for weight gain because he had lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, most, you know, 100% plant-based diet. He could not believe all the food that he was eating. He was like, I cannot eat all these food. <laughs> There's just too much. <laughs> I'm like, it's only plants. Just keep eating them. Um, so eating the rainbow for people who might, you know, might be listening or wondering what, what kind of diet is this? It doesn't really have to be anything specific. It could be like how many colors of the rainbow am I putting on my plate mm -hmm. every single day? Yeah. And then in this particular case, going back to the question of mushrooms, these mushrooms are, are magical in many ways. So he had a whole entire, um, protocol of mushrooms that are have, studies behind them and a lot of data behind them to help them mm -hmm. not only get rid of the side effects of chemo but also help them connect at a at a spiritual level with the part of his body that has been lost to chemo and he went to his eight week checkup to with the doctor and the doctor could not believe the human that walked in the door wow he had color in his face again he had gained like 25 pounds he had lost almost 40 pounds And I gained about 25 pounds back and it was like standing upright and smiling and his eyes were bright. And the doctor was like, what are you doing? <laughs> he even asked me if he had just fallen in love. And he's like, <laughs> I guess that's what it, I guess I have that kind of shine. Uh -huh. And um, and the doctor called me and told me uh, to thank me uh -huh. and, uh, and asked me for some, uh, you know, you information, go. some material. So I felt like a win. I haven't heard from that doctor again, <laughs> but. But it's, uh, listen, if I can convert one human, I can go to sleep. Uh, feeling uh, very happy. Oh, what a beautiful story. And uh, has his cancer gone? He is still in remission, yes, as of today. Still in remission. Yeah, so he was, okay, he would consider, in, you'll be considered in remission for five years after, after they can find cancer mm -hmm. in your system. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, let's hope that with this new lifestyle, Um, this remission will continue for the rest of his life. Uh, what a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay, Giovanka, could you now tell us more about your online community, your courses, classes, and how people can work with you? Obviously, I will include all the links to your online presence and, and to your books in the show notes so people will be able to access them. But could you just talk to your online community and your offerings, please? Yeah. So I have, a, again, the Wellness Markdown community, soon to be renamed the Reclaiming mm -hmm. Wellness community. Um, offer, so I offer lectures and classes. I go to, to universities and schools. Okay. I go to nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. to do live workshops and interactive classes. And then online within the community, I, I give classes uh, once a month, sometimes twice a month. And then I have other courses that are available uh, for self-study. One of them is called Get Off Sugar on how to reduce our simple sugar consumptions mm -hmm. while not, never being afraid of carbohydrates, especially complex carbohydrates. And the other one is called uh, Immune Defense with Herbs, which is a course on how to strengthen your immunity and mm -hmm. protect it using foods and herbs. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And I believe that uh, that book on how to reduce sugar cravings is a free download. People can just go and yep. download. The ebook oh, is a free download. It's just a, it's part of the bigger course, but it's just a great starting point to give uh -huh. you herbs and how to use these herbs. Most of them are the stuff that you can find in the supermarket with maybe one or two exceptions. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay. So I will also include this link in the show notes. 
Lovely. Well, we could be talking for another day, probably. <laughs> and, you know, we just scratched the surface, really, of of, of these topics. Uh, but the time has caught up with us. So what would be your key message, either as a, a as your own particular message or as a as a summary of this conversation, what would you like to leave our audience with? I will tell people that um, with everything that you choose to do today or tomorrow for your own health and well-being, with the understanding that you have, you need time, right, to get through a particular practice and get to know it and kind of like master it. Remember that even if it's just for five minutes a day, when you pick up that wellness practice, You'll be honoring this amazing machine we call a body, right? But we're also honoring the people that came before us that chances are sacrificed so much for us to be where we are today. And you'll be honoring and passing along amazing knowledge to the people that come after you, whether it is your children, grandchildren, or the community at large. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jivanka, for your beautiful presence and sharing with us all your wisdom well not all but a lot of a lot of it which which we much appreciate that was lovely thank you so much well all the best on your journey which i'm sure will continue very successfully and i would encourage our listeners who are interested in this topic to contact javanka through the links that you will find in the show notes and uh if that's what you would like to do maybe work with Jovanka and see how she can help you. Thank you so much, Jovanka. All the best. Thank you so much for having me, Anna. Thanks. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes and other podcast info, please go to my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.